I would like to introduce our first speaker. It's Margie L. She's from Mission Peak. Hi family, my name is Margie L. from Mission Peak and I am a grateful, grateful, grateful recovering addict. Hi, Margie. And uh, I want to thank the committee for asking me to come here and speak and share my experience, strength and hope with you. I want to welcome any new people. I want to welcome any people that needed to go out and do some more research and that are back. I hope that uh, you keep your seat. Okay. Now I want to take a moment. I want to take a moment to silence my mind. And I want to take a moment to ask God to come into my share. Because when I ask God to come into my share, and I take my ego out and I speak from my heart, then he's able to translate. So anybody who wants to take that moment of silence with me, please feel free to do so. Thank you. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, how it was for me, how I got to Narcotics Anonymous, and how it is today. Um, you know, I started, I was born into a hostage situation. And the reason why that I say I was born into a hostage situation is because I was born into a family that the norm was drinking, drugging, and a whole lot of violence. I was born in San Francisco, and my earliest childhood memories were sitting in a bar top in Patrol Hill with my father. And I can remember those old pistachio machines that were on that bar top. And my father was this really happy-go-lucky guy, and wherever that he was at, Everybody wanted to be at. He had a really pretty smile, Colgate smile with dimples, and um, and he was my hero. My father was my hero, and I can remember him starting to call me Dynamite at a really, really young age. And if you can think back to the nicknames that people called you, you know, back when you were little or back when you were wherever that you were at, I felt like I had to live up to that nickname with my dad. So I did everything that I could to live up to that name, Dynamite. So I moved, we moved to a lot of places. My father was a drug addict. I didn't know that until years later. But, you know, we moved from San Francisco and moved all the way down to San Jose. I went to a different school from kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade. And, you know, my mom was born in the Hawaiian Islands and she came over here when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor by cover and night. They just blacked out the islands in Honolulu. They gave everybody a number. They gave them a gas mask. And then the Navy escorted him over to the mainland. My father was a merchant seaman. He had 10 sisters. He had three brothers. He had four half-brothers. And he left his family really early, dropped out of school, not for the same reason that kids do today, but because he had a really large family. And it was his duty as a son to take care of his family. So he had traveled around the world about three times by the time that he had met my mom. They fell in love, they got married, and they had all three of us children by the time that she was 21 years old. So I can remember the first way that I changed the way that I felt, and I can remember that I moved to San Jose. And there was a recess out on the playground, and the kids, we would breathe really hard, and then somebody would come behind us, and we would, they would squeeze us, and we would pass out. And we would wake up and we could see, you know, just feel all woozy and see all them, you know, stars and all this kind of stuff. And I kept doing it over and over and over again. And then I can remember my first drug of choice was candy. When I started eating candy and I can remember eating candy and eating candy and then pretty soon doing anything to get candy when I didn't have it. Stealing from my mom and dad, going to the drugstore and stealing and get caught first grade stealing candy. And so my life just, you know, the, our family parties consisted of my aunts and uncles, blackout drunk, sliding down the walls, peeing on themselves, and us kids having to pick them up to get them into bed, you know, them chasing each other around at the parties with shotguns and 
fighting with each other and doing all that kind of insanity, you know. So I moved and moved and moved, and at 13 years old, I started shooting heroin in the Hunter's Point Project when I was 13 years old. And I'm going to wrap what I'm talking about around Narcotics Anonymous because it's kind of like, you know, when I was a youngster and I saw everybody out there that I thought had it going on, that was doing all this kind of stuff and I wanted to be like them, I began to start talking like them, dressing like them, and pretty soon that I came to be like them. So I remember these older group of kids came over and they got me, you know, after school and they said, hey, let's go to San Francisco, we're going to take you somewhere. And they went over, we went over there, and when they went over there, you know, they were shooting heroin. And I can remember trusting this man to shoot what, into my arm what he said was going to be in there and that I was going to feel how that I was going to feel. And I never you know, asked him for a resume, and I didn't take the dope to drug lab to see what was in it. I just trusted that process. What he said was going to happen was going to ha happen. It's the same thing newcomers, like when you come to Narcotics Anonymous, we drive up to Narcotics Anonymous, and we feel like that we can't trust, or we kind of move slowly through here, and we're checking each, everything out and taking people's inventory and all that stuff. And it's the same kind of concept if you think back to, because there's two times in the addict's life that they never forget. And that's the first time that they used, or the last day that they got loaded, right? And the first time that they got clean, because I can remember what it was like for me. And so if you think back to that time that we trusted whatever that, that drug of choice was, that whoever gave it to us, wherever that we were, we trusted that and we did that. And so what happened for me when I was 13 years old, and I can look back at 13-year-olds 13 13 year now and say, I was like really, really young, really, really young, you know? And so for the next 28 years of my life, I turned my will and my life over to the care of heroin. And I can remember saying to myself that if I ever did that, oh, I would stop. Oh, if I ever did that, and our literature talks about that, right? It talks about the yets in our literature and the gift in a story in here, a gift called life. See, I bring my paraphernalia with me. This is my paraphernalia because I damn sure didn't go to the dope house without my paraphernalia. So I don't come to me without my paraphernalia, which is the basic text, this blue book right here. You know, and so inside of this book, it talks about the yets. And some of you might be sitting there and saying, well, I didn't do that. Well, I didn't stick a needle in my arm. And that's a yet, meaning you're eligible to. And for some of us, it's an again. And pretty soon when I had told myself when I was a youngster that if I ever did that, I would stop. Oh, if I ever did that, if I ever shot dope in my neck, I would stop. If I ever turned a trick, I would stop. And it just continued and continued and continued for me. And then I ended up in juvenile hall. And then I ended up going into California Youth Authority. See, because my disease didn't stay outside. Because when I went into the institutions, my disease didn't stay outside. I used to live and I used and I, I used to live and I lived to use. And that's what it was. So no matter what institution that I was in, I found a way to get dope and to get myself loaded. And so I went in and out and in and out and in and out. And I'm not really going to talk about all that stuff because if you're sitting here, if you've earned your seat in Narcotics Anonymous, each one of us that are sitting here right now knows the tab that we picked up to earn our seat in Narcotics Anonymous. I had a brother that was an addict. My sister ended up being an addict. And I can remember escaping from California Youth Authority and coming back to my sister's house. And she was a housewife with a child, you know, and I had met him, right? Because it didn't matter. The one that was in the room with the most tattoos, one of the requirements, right? Coming up out of whatever, my antennas went up and it was him. And I need to say man, woman, or beast because it really didn't matter to me. It didn't matter to me. Whatever I could pull in to get me out of how I was feeling, that's what I did. I've been married to five men and I don't know how many women through this journey of insanity for me. So I can remember when this guy comes out, you know, and I've been with a lot of different people that claimed a lot of different that, and I claimed it with him, right? The chameleon, whatever you wanted me to be, that's what I was. And so I can remember doing all kinds of robberies with this guy. And I remember going to my sister, escaping from youth authority, and her crying and saying, Margie, if you don't stop, you're going to kill somebody or someone's going to kill you. But I didn't stop, right? I didn't stop because by that time, when I was a teenager, I believed that I was born to be a heroin addict. And nothing was ever going to change for me. And if I believed that I was born to be a heroin addict, guess where I placed my body? In every dope house, in every jail house. 
So he ended up getting a shot in a robbery. I was just turning 17 years old. I had a little trust fund. The trust fund, the stipulations was, if you turn 18 or you get married first. Simple mathematics, right? Let's go get married. And for some of you guys of my age, we went to Reno, got married with those little spoon rings, right? And I was there, and I didn't really want to get married, but, you know, my dad and I had made all this chaos, and my family was there, and they were poking me in the back, like, say yes, say yes. So I said, I do. And I said, I do a lot, and I said, I don't a lot also. So we ended up, you know, living in our mansion in the Tenderloin and the TL, 434 Leavenworth, up, you know, and uh, waited until the bank opened and got the money out, you know, and went and lived there, and then he ended up getting shot in a robbery that we were in. And I ended up going back to Youth Authority. And so I went back to Youth Authority, and by this time my brother was a bank robber. He was in Lompoc. My sister wasn't using yet, got out of Youth Authority. She was using, and instead of saying to my sister, Debbie, you don't want to do this. Now I had my blood with me, so I taught my sister how to do everything, and we were ripping and running out there, you know. So I ended up going into prison when I was 22 years old. And when I went into prison, some of you that have been there, we used to call it CI Wonderful, right? It was a campus in those days, and there was only 500 women in prison. So I can remember getting out of prison. You know, I paroled. I did a, you know, and I'm going to talk a little bit. I did a shoe term. And I can remember being in prison, and I can remember using in prison and going in and out of prison. And I can also remember that this one particular term, it didn't matter to me if I got out of prison. Because why should I even get out? All I was going to do was have to go back to the holding cell, get on the chain, stop at Burger King, and go back to the prison, and then do all that stuff you know, that, that we had to do when we went back. And I can remember going and doing that shoe term, and I can remember sitting on that yard, and the CO's coming and saying, Margie, we got a name for you on one of those cells. And I was like, I bet you do. And I ended up going in that shoe term, and I can remember standing and going up there at that sally port when that grill opened up and I was, you know, in my muumuu and my chanclas and I remember it closing and I went inside the middle like the horses are when the, the horse races and the gun goes off and the gate opens up and that's what I felt like because I knew that I had to perform for you guys as soon as that second gate opened up. I can remember looking at no warning shots will be fired and birds flying up in there and I remember having a feeling of fear in my gut but I was constitutionally inab unable to show that fear. So I went and I performed. So I got out of prison and nothing stopped for me. I went in, I went out, I went in, I went out, you know. And um, the children was Lompoc, CRC, and then um, CIW. And this one time I ended up getting out after doing a shoe term and I got my time back and my sister had rolled up this time. And I didn't teach my sister anything good once again. I showed her how to use in there, how to do all kinds of that stuff in there. And I can remember on July 7th of 1985 that I got a call from a friend of mine. They said, Margie, your sister, I'm sorry. And nobody had to tell me that my sister was dead, that she had died in prison. That didn't stop me. Nothing stopped me. It was just another reason to go on a suicide mission. 1994, July 14th was my last overdose. See, because at the end of this, I was calling feed and farm stores to try to buy some arsenic because I didn't want to live anymore. I can remember walking through doors and just kicking, kicking them closed. I used to look in the mirror and try to fix my face and just say, who are you? What are you? Who have you become? I was just one big conglomeration of pain by that time. And so I overdosed. I was in the county jail and I overdosed and I came to, right? on the floor of that drunk tank with the silver toilet, with the matching sink, on the hard, cold, plastic, scratchy mattress. I had really, really long hair. I had an orange mumu on that said prisoner across the chest. And I can remember drawing my legs up to my chest and putting my hair over my legs to try to keep myself warm. And then I can remember having a feeling in the pit of my gut of total and complete hopelessness and despair. And my self-talk told me, it was like, Margie, it's not good enough that you're facing a life sentence because that's what I was facing. You can still find a way to make yourself sink lower in the depravity of this disease, although I did not know it was a disease at that time. 
And then the cop came and keyed the door. And there I went. Our literature talks about it, the mask that we wear. I put that mask on because I wanted to, when he keyed the door, I wanted to say, somebody help me. Please help me. I don't know how to live. I don't know how to live inside an institution, outside of an institution. But once again, I wasn't able to because I was afraid of what you guys were going to think about me. And I was killing myself for what I thought that you thought about me and who you thought I needed to be. So I went back to that pod and two things happened. Significant emotional events or negative experience after a significant emotional event follows change. It wasn't three strikes you're out. It was treatment in the county jail that I had been raised in since I got a dishonorable discharge from California Youth Authority. And I went into that treatment program. And I went to my first H&I meeting. And when I went into my first H&I meeting, I didn't want to go. And they said, you know what, little mofo? That's why you're going to go. I got hate N.A. And they said, well, that's why you're going to go see why you feel so strong about something you don't know nothing about. And so I went to that first meeting, and when I went, went to that first meeting, there was a woman in there that I had walked to the gate in 1979, and she had told me, Marjorie, if you don't stop the braid, your braid is going to be silver. And she was a speaker at the meeting. And it was through her, our first step. See, the first step admitted that I was powerless over my addiction, that my life was unmanageable. It's pretty unmanageable when I'm waking up on the floor of a drunk tank once again, facing a life sentence, running out of all, blowing up all the bridges, burning up all the buildings, doing all that kind of stuff. Nobody wanted me but CDCR. So I could see that first step, and the second step was in her eyes. And it talks about the credibility that this works through identification, newcomers, is that when we get here, this woman started speaking, and she started telling me that she was clean and that she hadn't been back to prison and that her life was good. And I began to start believing it was through her eyes. It's not that I believed in me. I believed in her because I knew where she had been. And I'm not talking about the geographical locations and this talks about in our literature. I'm talking about the hangouts of horror that our spirits visited every time, every time that we took something. And so I told myself, Maybe, just maybe, that I could do something different too. And so I began to start working my steps in there, you know. And I came here believing in a punishing God, but I came to believe in a power greater than myself. I surrendered. I got into acceptance. I got honest. See, step one strips us of the, the, the illusions of our addiction. The self-righteousness of my character defects when I got to six, looking at that. The dying inside, being where I was at, and still acting like that I was better, and then I was running something up in the penitentiary, up in that little piece of dirt, you know? And then working on the fourth, taking that inventory, looking, looking at all the garbage. It's like, oh my God, the pain. When I drag that garbage into the light in my fifth step and I admit it to another human being and to God and I looked at that garbage, my defects of character, the awareness of that was very painful in me. And then I started to go through and make that list of my defects, the things that I thought that I needed to hang on to. See, because I was surviving, I wasn't living. So you can die at 13 and you can live till you're 40 around here. Because see, in our literature, it talks about that this is a spiritual, not religious program. On Roman numeral 16 in this basic text, it says, based on our experience, we believe that every addict, even the potential addict, and that means the person in there is maybe not believing that they are an addict, you know, that we suffer from an incurable disease of mind, body, and spirit. And that we're in the grips of a hopeless dilemma. The solution is spiritual in nature. And I didn't understand that when I got here. I've had a lot of loss here. There's 48 musts in this basic text. And one of them is that no matter what tragedies life brings, one thing is clear that no matter what, we must not take anything. And I am a member of the no matter what club. I remember coming to your convention a couple years ago 
And my husband got murdered June 9, 2010. And I remember always talking about no matter what, I wasn't going to take anything, right? God creates opportunities for us to get into action in a whole lot of different areas, and I don't question. And the day that my husband was murdered, here's the miracles of the program. The day that my husband was murdered, I went downstairs, and I was talking to my sister-in-law, and I began to start making amends to David. And she looked at me, and she goes, Margie, you're going to have an opportunity to make amends when you're on that step. And I kept making those amends. And then I went upstairs and I went downstairs and I said, let's go to a meeting. And that's when I got the phone call. And I can remember sitting in that interrogation room for four and a half hours. And I had just got finished working my third step. I made a decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of heroin. The same decision when I was 13 years old. So because of our program, and because of the principles of this program, I wasn't able to get up and go crazy and act out and not trust God. I needed to have faith and I needed to have trust that everything was gonna be okay. And that there was a plan for me as there always had been as soon as I was able to get out of my way. After when um, I got David's death certificate within about two weeks, David died at 6.48 p.m. That was the time that I was making my amends to him. So I know about spirit when I read this literature and I didn't really understand what's God's will, what's my will, what is spirit. I understand today what spirit is because when we lowered David's body into the ground at the cemetery, it hit me right then. That's not even David. David's already gone. So I know today that we're all here on borrowed time and we're all walking each other's home. And so what I need to do is I need to be kind to myself the same way that we eat food and we keep our energy up and we watch our nutrition and what we're going to eat and we take care of this temple right here. Well, it's the same thing that we do for our spirit. And that's by being kind to each other. That's by giving ourselves a break. See, because, see, see, we don't get to come here to Narcotics Anonymous and rob Narcotics Anonymous. We get to come here in the beginning of this book that talks about the, 40s, the first must. Everything that occurs in the course of NA service must be motivated by the desire to more successfully carry the message to the addict who still suffers. That's why that we do this. That's why that we have hospitals and institutions. That's why we drive from wherever that we drive from, that we get in our car and I drove, because that's what I did for my dope. I drove for my dope, you know. And so, you know, the person who murdered David, it was about six months and we didn't know. And, and me and my friends on, you know, December 18th, we went up to the cemetery and we prayed and people said things that they needed to say to David and his son. And... Um, the next day at 7 a.m., I got a call from the lead detective, and he said, Marjorie, we got a full confession from the person that murdered your husband. And I went through a process, see, because none of this was easy. I'm here to talk about it today, but I worked my steps around this process. There were a lot of people that were taking different positions, and it was very, very painful. My gratitude list used to be all the things that I could clearly see. My gratitude list became the people that were bringing me pain because even the people that are bringing me pain, that are gossiping about me, that are talking about me, are my teachers. Because then I have to dig really, really deep inside of me to get the character of Margie. I got through this with dignity. And this is God's will for us, is to walk with dignity. And I got through that, and I got through this, and I got through everything. And so there were some days I was really angry at this man. And I can remember screaming into my pillow his name and saying, I hate you, you know. And God also created more opportunities because three weeks ago, I went to get a pedicure. And when I was in the pedicure, get the pedicure, this woman walked in. And she wanted what she wanted, and she wanted it right now. And I usually don't intervene in things, you know. 
and she wanted this nail polish and she wanted someone to stop her nails got messed up and she wanted to do it right now she was on her way to a um, family reunion I said you know there's a store down the street and I'm sure that if you went to that store that you could probably find the color that you want they have a lot of really pretty colors right so she stopped for a moment she looked at me and then she was well I'm not from here and then she went right back to what she was doing so they moved me to this tub to get my toes done and the lady rolled this little baby in this stroller, rolls the stroller behind this glass door. And it's one of those doors that if you open it, it's going to slam and it could hurt the baby. I said, I don't think that's very safe. I told to the young girl next to me, I don't think this is very safe. And uh, I said, is there a baby in there? She said, yeah. So she came back. She moved the baby and I pulled the stroller and I pulled the baby right next to me. And I looked and I said, okay, the baby's sleeping. And so we began to start talking, and she was there with the group, and she was there for her family reunion. She says it normally that she doesn't go to the family reunion. And I said, oh, where are you, your family coming? She said, Texas. And I said, oh, I used to go to the family reunions with my husband in Louisiana. And she says, well, oh, but I'm from East Palo Alto. And then we talked a little bit more, and I said, oh, my husband was from East Palo Alto. She said, what's his name? I said, David Lewis. And she stopped and her mouth opened and she said, the person's name who murdered David, she said, that's my uncle. And the woman that you were talking to, that's his sister. And that woman right there, two tubs down, that's his mother. And so at that time, they took me back over to the other seat and I just closed my eyes and I just started breathing and my heart was beating. and. And I said, God, what, what is it that you want me to do? And then I knew what I was supposed to do. And so I got up and I looked at the woman and she looked at me and I saw kindness in her eyes and there was kindness in my eyes. And I went to her and I put my hand on her arm and I said, my name is Margie Allen, and my husband's David Lewis and I just want to say, God bless you. And this woman, she's an older lady, she has gray hair, and she started talking to me, and she started telling me about her struggles, how it was for her, and that she had just picked her husband up that morning from the airport, and that he was paralyzed on one side now, and they had went to the jail, and they had went to visit Greg, and how sorry that he was, and he wishes that he could say how sorry that he was, because he remembers going to David's mother's house and eating there. And so I listened to her, and I knew at an even deeper level what I was there for. And so I said to her, I just want to let you know that I forgive Gregory and if you could let Gregory know that. And so that's just another miracle of this program, see, because when my sister died in prison, that is not the position that I took. I was on revenge. I wanted to know who was in that cell with her. You know, when I got that incident report, there were nail marks up inside of her that where they had taken her dope out of her. They had taken all their gold off of her body, you know. And I went on a suicide mission, and I didn't want to do that again. And then the other thing that I know today, even with it, whoever women that were in that cell with my sister, that they have to live with that. I'm not the judge here, even with this gentleman, you know. And I can even say gentleman. You know, because who's to say that it wasn't me that would have killed somebody at any time? That could have been me. I could have been in that situation. I'm, the I'm not the judge. God is, and, and I'm just going to. So he's back, and he goes to court, and I don't choose to go to court. They call me up, the victim's advocate, and there's just really no reason why for me to go to court. I see no reason to sit in the courtroom and take all that in. I've done a lot of work around it. And I came to the Monterey Convention, um, and I can remember that there was a... Um, topic meeting there and it was on grief and loss and one of the members from this area and I was able to talk to her because when she was up here I recognized her voice she hadn't said her name and I recognized her voice and I went and asked her and I can remember listening to her buying her speaker tape and listening to that over and over and over again see because see I know what my role is all of us once that we get through, that our job is to come back, you know, and give it away in order for us to keep it and help the next person. So my whole passion is hospitals and institutions. I ended up getting 42 years and four months suspended by the grace of God, you know, allowed to go into a treatment program, came out of the treatment program, thought I was well, and then got into Narcotics Anonymous, back in after the jail, 
and I took suggestions around here. The same suggestions that I took when somebody taught me. See, because we didn't just come here learning how to do this. We didn't come here knowing how to do this, how to socialize with each other. You know, there's a lot of fear. You know, when we're coming here like, oh my God, are they going to welcome me? Am I going to know anybody? Am I going to, you know, and so a lot of times that we don't do it. But it's the same kind of desperation that got us here that's going to keep us here. And today that desperation has turned into passion. And so I go back into San Quentin. I just went into the federal prison the other day and I stayed there all day. I have been to Africa. I have went to, you know, NA in Africa. I went all over the world and I have got to experience Narcotics Anonymous. I got to go to the world conventions, you know, and there, that's just an awesome, awesome thing to see thousands of addicts in one place. And even though if we don't know each other's name, it's just a look across, across the room and it goes like this. You know that I know that you know that I know. And so I want to thank you guys very much for inviting me here to share my experience, strength, and hope with you. And if nobody has told you that they love you today, I definitely, definitely do. Thank you. Thank you. Now let me introduce our second speaker, Jerome P. from Sonoma County. Hi everybody, my name is Jerome, I'm an addict. I, like uh, Margie, also want to thank the folks that invited me here today. And I certainly would like to thank all the volunteers that put this event on. I think we all should thank them. This is quite an event, and I'm impressed. So, uh, I don't know which direction I want to go. Uh, I can tell you one thing, you're free raiser of hell out there. Them exits, I, I don't get them. I, I don't know how many times I got spun around going the wrong direction. <laughs> kind of weird. Anyways, uh, I'll probably share a little bit of, of what I call the war story, uh, partially because I needed to hear that when I got here, and I saw there was a lot of newcomers here. And the reason why I needed to hear that when I got here was because if if you had pulled more robberies than me, if you had done more time than me, if you'd hurt more people than me, I would say to myself, if they can do it, why can't I? And that was my inspiration. So I needed to hear some of those stories, uh, some of the things we did to people, how we harmed ourselves and others. Uh, and I'd also like to talk probably a little bit about H&I, because that's why we're here. It's an H&I fundraiser. Uh, it's a big passion in my recovery, a very large passion in my recovery. I uh, got introduced to doing hospitals and institutions at three months clean by my sponsor who had been doing H&I for eight years, who his sponsor had been doing H&I for 12 years at that time. And uh, I never left. I've been doing H&I since then. My clean date's 11 11 91. You know, it's kind of funny too, because when I share my story, it's actually embarrassing to me now. Uh, partially because of my own ego and some of my own pride and it's kind of just embarrassing the, the place my addiction took me to. You know, I, I don't know about you guys, but there was a lot of times I hit different bottoms in recovery and, and they were just, you know, like a skipping stone on the water. I'd hit and then I'd get going again. And, and, the, and the final time for me, when I hit, I hit real hard. And, you know, I, I'm here to tell you folks, you don't have to have done time. You don't have to have used like I did or Margie used. You know, you look for the similarities, and so it's not a prerequisite to have been locked up. It's not a prerequisite to just destroy your life. I think the fact that you're here, you know, gains you that seat for whatever reason and stay here. You know, they say keep coming back. I say just don't leave. I think that's a better approach. So anyways, uh, 
my disease moved rather rapidly for me in the sense that, uh, you know, I was one of those kids in, in society where it looked like I was going to go somewhere. I had a shot maybe at some college ball. I was probably, you know, one of those ones that was determined to be most likely to succeed coming out of high school. I came from a family of folks that didn't use, which is really unusual around here. And uh, my disease moved really fast in the sense that uh, I graduated high school and was in state prison. I uh, was supporting my drug habit pulling armed robberies and got caught doing those. I had no concept that I would get caught. I thought I'd just retire someday. So at age 19, I was in state prison. And I wished there was H&I in those facilities at that time so I would have got a clue as to what gave me the opportunity to put a gun in people's faces and take their money. Uh, there was an H&I in the facilities I was in, and I didn't understand how I got there necessarily. It wasn't clear. You know, I'll never forget when I got out of prison, there was a guy that I was hanging out with, and he comes down the hallway looking like Elmer Fudd carrying a shotgun. And I'm thinking, what is going on? And, and he points to the ceiling and tells me to be quiet. There's somebody up there. And I thought, whew, man, that guy is loaded, and I'll never be like that, right? They were, I think they, they'd sold their house, and they were smoking it right in front of my eyes. So, uh, you know, to kind of cut to the chase, uh, you know, and even in the institution, I didn't quit. I was running drugs into the institution. I was gang-affiliated, which I'm not proud of. A uh, matter of fact, uh, I have some tattoos on myself that I really should take off because I just don't live my life that way, nor think that way. But they fit at the time when I was there. Uh, so, you know, getting out of prison, I, you know, I, I couldn't even figure it out. I didn't understand when I got there, because I talked to a lot of guys there, why you would be on your second and third term for robbery. Couldn't you learn how to do burglaries or grand theft auto? I mean, you're surrounded by a bunch of guys that do that stuff. Why would you get out and do the same crime again? Because if you know anything about how law enforcement works, once you pull a crime, the next time that crime happens, they're putting your mugshot in the next lineup. So they're going to be looking for you if there's another robbery happening. Well, when I got out and I went back to the same behavior that I had, and actually that behavior never changed. I did that same behavior when I was locked up. I went back to the same thing I'd done before, and I went back to using a gun. And uh, that's when it became clear to me how you'd end up going back in there for the same thing. You know, this disease, you know, this disease took me there. So I was real lucky in the sense that for a lot of years, I didn't get caught again. But what I did in those years uh, was what most of us do, and that is I hurt a lot of people. And most of all, I probably hurt myself. I took advantage of those who loved me the most and respected those that probably didn't deserve any respect. And I ran that way for a very long time until I was age 33. In, the, in those last years uh, before age 33, there was attempts to get recovery, and what I would do is I'd show up at a meeting like once a year, once every two years, and I didn't hear anything. So if you're here new today and you don't hear anything, it's okay. What I got from being here in those times is there was a place people came to and if you want to stop, this is where you come to. And that's what I did get. And I didn't hear that. I just saw that. So hopefully you're seeing that today, if nothing else. I also grabbed some literature off the tables, which is now kind of vintage literature, worth a few dollars, interestingly enough, that I, for some reason, kept. Uh, so that's kind of cool. But I didn't hear anything. So I, didn't even, I can't even call it a relapse. Because I firmly believe in order to relapse, you have to at least get a little bit of clarity, a little bit of sanity in order to make that decision to relapse. If you just come in here, maybe still loaded and go out tomorrow and get more loaded, that's not a relapse. You didn't stop, right? So I did that for about eight years, usually to get over on somebody, like get more money from mom or let my wife move back into the house or whatever. It was all a game. So at the end, I'll just jump right to the end now, because you don't need to hear about a bunch of the stuff in between, because you all probably lived it in one way or another. At the end, I, uh, I was chasing a thing that looked like the predator. You know the thing, it, it kind of quivers, you can't see it, and it's in the trees? You know, you guys ever see the movie The Predator? 
I was trying to kill it. So that's what I was doing at age 33. I was uh, crawling out on my stomach at night with a 9 millimeter down the back of my pants, and I'm going to go kill the predator. Because uh, you guys didn't understand, but there's aliens on this planet, and the CIA is involved in all the drugs. And I'll never forget uh, one evening on a long stake out in the backyard, laying flat in the grass, as low as I could be with all the lights off, my wife throwing open the back door, turning on the lights, screaming, what the hell are you doing out there? And me saying, shh, they're up there. I flashed back at that moment, remembering my friend looking like Elmer Fudd. So uh, it, it wasn't pretty. You know, I had, like, uh, boards outside the windows of my house with 16-penny nails sticking through them. You guys know what a 16-penny nail is? It's a big-ass nail. So if someone tried to look in my window, I'd hear them scream, and I could get the drop on them. It wasn't unusual to find my couch in the morning wedged up against the front door. That's the way my kids would wake up to see Dad had barricaded us in once again. I was real violent. I was real dangerous. I remember when I moved out of that house, my landlord said, I've never seen a house with every door jam busted. My wife had this thing about locking me out, and I had this thing about knocking that door in. Uh, pretty terrifying individual in a lot of ways. So at 33, I hit what I call all bottoms. It wasn't just one. I was no longer skipping along on the water. It was emotional. It was financial. It was physical, psychological. I was done. I remember trying to get on board, uh, I believe they're called Black Hawk helicopters. I believe they were landing for me to take me away. Uh, so I'd see them landing in fields and try and drive there. True story. So obviously I was out of my mind. No one wanted to hang around me. You know you're in bad shape if the dealer doesn't want to answer the phone or come to the door. And that was about the state of mind I was in. And fortunately, I remembered you guys. And I remember hearing about you guys. Well, that wasn't enough, but I remember that. So I went to, uh, first I went around the corner, and I talked to this guy who used to wear an NA t-shirt. Still does, as a matter of fact. And uh, told him about the aliens, the CIA out there, and I could see them, and no one else can. And he looked at me, and he goes, you need to go to 90 meetings in 90 days. And I'm like, damn, didn't want to hear that, right? So he said, come back when you're ready. And that wasn't enough for me. So I went up to this treatment facility and saw an addict who was a counselor who I'd met several times when me and my ex-wife were trying to fix our marriage. We, we had this propensity to try and get counseling. And then we'd go in there and yell at each other and blame each other for all the problems. And the counselors would always say the same thing to us. In order for us to help you guys, you've got to stop using drugs. But we couldn't hear that. So I uh, went up and saw this counselor and told him about the aliens and the CIA and he looked at me and he goes whew your feet are off the ground man and I remember looking down at my feet to see if I was levitating and that is not what he was talking about obviously I was out of my mind and he looks at me and he goes you need to check into our program right now or do an outpatient program and do 90 meetings in 90 days now I don't know about you guys but I'm already when I drive down the street doing U-turns to make sure I'm not being followed and definitely not telling anyone where I'm going. So for two independent parties to tell me the same thing is a very frightening thing because I'm trying to figure out how they can talk to each other. It wasn't until my 20th birthday my mom reminded me how I had dragged her down to their family dentist and asked him to pull all my teeth because I was convinced they were wired. She just reminded me of that shortly ago. Poor mom. Anyways, uh, I kind of felt like I was in the Truman Show, if you guys ever saw that movie. I just felt like I was being followed everywhere I went, and I was being watched everywhere I went. So I had to be pretty deceptive at that point. And like a good addict, you know, we, we, we just, even the writing's right on the wall, we just won't take the answer, you know. We got to just beat it into us or beat it out of us, whatever it may be. So I went down to another county and talked to my sister-in-law's boss, who was a psychiatrist, told him about the aliens and the CIA and he looks at me and, he, and, he, and this guy looked like a psychologist too and he, he gives me one of these I think you're in some kind of psychosis and you need to go to 90 meetings in 90 days that was a kiss of death I have to tell you 
damn. So what do you do, right? That's what I heard. Fortunately, I had one more resource. A fellow had been trying to help me because he's really worried about me, and he'd known me a long time. Matter of fact, and he told me years later, he goes, Jerome, every time we met, I used to bring a gun because you scared the hell out of me, and rightfully so. So he turned me on to the, the mental facility in town and uh, told me to call them, the psychiatric ward, I guess it was. So I called them, and they asked some strange questions like, how long has it been since you killed somebody? Do you still have the gun? And at the end of these strange questions, they said, you know, we think you should come up here and check in. And uh, I'm like, okay. And then they said, one thing you need to know, though, we, you can't be afraid. Don't be afraid that there's going to be a lot of bright light when you get here. And I thought, the hell with that crap. I'm going to a meeting, man. So that's how I got here. There's a choice between the bright light or the meetings, right? So now I'm here, and obviously still probably out of my mind for some time. And thank God for Narcotics Anonymous. You know, I couldn't talk when I got here. Matter of fact, I learned to talk doing H&I work. Monday nights, 100 guys there, captive audience. The guy got to listen to me. I learned to speak in front of people. You know, it's such a, a benefit now in, in corporate America when I have to speak to a board of directors or things like that. I, I just, you know, it's just like a group of addicts to me. I just get up in front of them and talk like nothing else, right? They don't know where I learned to speak. I didn't tell them I learned in the jail. Anyways, uh, when I got here, not only did I do that 90 days and 90 meetings, I did 14 months every day, sometimes twice, sometimes three times a day. And thank God. You know, I got my life back. I got my mind back. I'll never forget, I had three months clean, and I uh, went up. I used to hang out at that detox because it was safe. Like, if the meetings were done for the day, I didn't want to be alone, so I'd just go up there and hang out with the counselors and stand there at the doorway. And one of the counselors said, uh, I was telling her about the helicopters, and she goes, Jerome, did they talk to you? And I got so excited. I'm like, no. And I thought, she's more messed up than I was. It's so cool, you know? But anyways, uh, I did what was suggested. That guy with that NAT shirt, he became my sponsor and is still my sponsor. Uh, I started working the steps right away. I needed to work the steps right away. You know, there's a, I call it the snowball effect, and I probably stole that from somebody else. But the snowball effect is when you do a bunch of crap in your life, just because you decide to stop doesn't mean the crap doesn't keep rolling downhill, right? So thank God for the steps because it gave me tools to deal with that crap that I started for many, many years rolling that didn't know how to deal with it other than get loaded. And it gave me tools to deal with life, family, friends, myself. So I was really stoked about learning the steps because it gave me something. I got into service right away, like I said, at, at three months clean. I started doing literature for H&I. That's about all I was capable of. They trained me to do literature. That means they trained me about the IPs. I wasn't allowed to order by myself for several months. Uh, I learned what the IPs were for and which IPs to order to take into jails. Uh, what, a, what a fun time that's been. Anyways, uh, so I got into service, steps sponsor, you know, what more is there, right? So, and I started doing this thing, and, and I got to tell you, this thing has been just, I wouldn't trade it for the world, how good this thing has been for me. And hopefully I, I have enough time to share with you folks some of those good things that have come that I didn't even expect to come from being here. Anyways, uh, let's see. You know, because I've probably, I've been clean longer than I've used now, and that's a gift in its own. Uh, I can tell you about, you know, some about, a little bit about, I'll share a little bit about the steps. You know, the second step is really big for me in the sense that, you know, step one is really easy. It was just real clear that I was powerless over drugs, my addiction, and it was real clear that my life was a manageable, just really clear. So I, there was no fight in me over that one. And the second step, the same thing. I, I needed to be restored to sanity. That was real clear for me. But I took that, you know, and we apply these steps in other areas after we stay clean for a while. It became a tool in all parts of my life. So I don't know about you guys, man, but when I run into a wall, I don't run into it a second time. I call my sponsor. Maybe I'll go over the top of it. Maybe I'll find a way around it. Maybe I'll tunnel underneath it. And the cool thing I learned here also is maybe if I just sit there for a while and watch it, it'll move on its own, you know. Doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result has really been my motto. It, and it's really cool when you practice that. It's amazing how you get different results. Just do anything different and see what happens the next morning. 
comb your hair a different way and see how people talk to you tomorrow. Anyways, uh, that's the second step. The fourth step was very enlightening and, and a huge tool. But one of the gifts that came from it was about relationships. Now, I got to tell you, I dragged a psychotic woman into this program, and she wasn't here to stay. And they never talked about, you know how they say, stay out of a relationship for the first year. I had one, and it was messed up. So the last thing I needed was another one. So I chose to stick with the men and stay away from women because I already had a problem. I didn't need any more. And forgive my French, but I certainly didn't want to shit where I eat, right? So that kept me away from a lot of the traps that maybe happened to some of you folks when you're trying to get this thing. And I was able to focus on my recovery. But one thing I learned in my four step when I did the relationship part was every relationship I had started out the person was wonderful. And at the end, they burst into flames. And I realized that I was the common denominator in all those relationships. And if I went back and did the same thing again in a different relationship, I probably would have another fire explosion, right? So I stayed out of relationships for seven years. It, uh, I think it was about four years clean. I took custody of three of my children who were at the time were one, four, and eight. I went to school at night, got several degrees in college, worked during the day and raised those children while in recovery. So I'm real sympathetic to women in this program who are single parents and especially single father parents in this program because I know what a challenge it is to get a meeting and get some recovery when you got homework and you've got daycare and you've got school and you've got work. I understand that completely. Sometimes you're just grasping to make a phone call to somebody who will talk some recovery with you so you don't kill your kids, right? And I didn't have a lot of skills with my children in the early years as it was. The first few months, I can remember just sitting in my chair and watching them like I was in a guard tower, making sure they didn't hurt themselves. That was the best I could do. Or maybe get a box and put it in the living room so they could play whatever they played in that box or a balloon. And stickers, I bought stickers up the Yazoo, and I'd give them the stickers and let them put them on this little toy table to keep them busy for hours so I could get some sanity for a moment, right? Because they'll tag team you, trust me. I'm really blessed. I have wonderful children in this program. Wonderful children. They are nothing like me. They also know that if they ever act like me, I'll try and kill them. So they better kill me first because I will not let them treat me like I treated my parents. You know, that's just a given. I was an ass. So my kids are awesome. I've got six now. I've got the Brady Bunch, three boys, three girls by marriage. I have this wonderful wife, uh, all a result of being in this program. Uh, my kids are so cool. They're a big part of my life. Generally, when I talk about my children, it brings tears to my eyes because they move me that much, and they're that special, and they're such a gift. They truly are a gift. I have one son in particular that all through my years of recovery has been a gem, just, just a, a bright light. I remember him when I was maybe five, six years clean, not even that, a little less than that, him sitting in his car seat, and I was still smoking cigarettes, and he, he looks over at me and goes, Dad, I thought you don't do drugs. And then I said, I don't. And he goes, well, you're smoking a cigarette, and they taught us today in school, cigarettes are a drug. So I quit, and I've never smoked again. You know, I stopped hitting my children, because I realized I was teaching them if they couldn't get their own way to hit somebody to get their own way. Not to mention there was anger in my my administration of those hits so I had to stop doing that before I hurt one of them I'll never forget uh, one time in uh, later years I was having a couple of the boys over for a sleepover and uh, now I'm about 15 years clean and I'm driving down the road and these kids cut me off on their bicycles they're about 21 years old and so I don't know about you guys but I had to chase them down and f-bomb them a little bit right so I'm, I got the windows down in the car, and I'm flipping these guys off. They're flipping me off. And one of the guys on the bicycle looks in the window and goes, Mister, I can't believe you talk like that in front of your kids. I'm like, damn. Forgot they were in that back seat, right? So I turn around in the back seat, and I look at him, and I say, Look, I understand you may have to tell your parents what happened here today, and I fully understand, and I don't blame you. You may not be able to ride with me in a vehicle anymore, and that's okay, right? 
So they got it, and next day I'm over at the high school picking up my son, and I hear across, uh, yell across the campus, guy, I hear this guy say, hey, Mr. Road Rage, you know, that became my name at the high school for the next two years. So let me share some other things with you, kind of going backward. My first two years of recovery, I did a lot of research. It wasn't a federal grant. I didn't get paid for this, but I did a lot of research. And that research was to ask every individual who relapsed, what happened? And that's the ones that made it back here. The ones that didn't make it back here, I don't know what happened to them. And some of them I did hear what happened to them. They died or it got worse. They got locked up. So, uh, and, and, and there will be a reason why I'm telling you this stuff right now. Partially because, like I said, newcomers, you know, if you don't hear, this is one of those pieces maybe you want to try and remember. And maybe some of you folks got a little bit of time. This might be one of those pieces you want to remember. Because I, I, I spent the time researching it, so what the hell. On top of that, I don't get it personally. At college, I took notes for my classes. At my business, I take notes for my business. We're here to save our lives, and we don't sit here and take notes. I don't get that. I still don't get that. So if you were to take notes, this might be something you want to write down, right? So I asked everybody what happened, and I'd hear the same thing over and over again. Enough so, I learned something. And what I learned from these people who had went out and came back is there was like these two layers of what would happen. The bottom layer always happened. And that's what I paid attention to. But I'd listen to the, the top layer first. And the top layer was they'd share something about I lost a loved one. I lost my job. I had to have surgery. Uh, I got in trouble with the law. They were being dishonest. I'd hear some kind of life-changing event in their life had happened. And that next layer that always I heard was, I stopped going to meetings. I stopped calling my sponsor. I stopped working my steps. So I don't know if you guys just heard what I said, but that revolving thing was don't stop working your steps, don't stop calling your sponsor, don't stop going to meetings, and there's a good chance you won't be being interviewed by me probably, right? So I made mental note of that. So let's talk about some other things recovery, and then you'll know why I just shared that story with you. H&I is a... Wow, if I'd known the gifts that came from me doing H&I work, uh, I, don't know why, I don't know why everyone doesn't do H&I work, to tell you the truth. I mean, I got told by my sponsor, you come to meetings, Jerome, until you want to come to meetings. I love coming to meetings. It's my favorite thing to do still. I vision myself retiring and coming to meetings. Isn't that weird? <laughs> Sounds weird, but I really like it here. I relate to you guys. You're my family. You're my tribe. I fit in with you guys. I go out into the real world. And I struggle sometimes, but in here I don't struggle. So uh, H&I has taken me to places that, uh, you know, I've gotten to do the juvenile facilities. I've gotten to go into the psychiatric wards. I've been, I've been going to our county jail for about 17 years. Uh, and I've done a lot of regional work also with H&I. And that regional work has opened doors to other spots where maybe I've gotten to present at World Services for an H&I event, or just recently I got an invitation to be involved with something else with World Services, and, and I didn't ask for it. I got invited to do it, but one of the gems of doing H&I happened at the, the last World Convention, and at the last World Convention, how many of you heard about how every state prison called in and participated in the Unity Day call? I saw two hands, so you need to hear that. 33 California state prisons on a telephone at the World Convention listening to our speaker meeting on that Sunday. We had 7, 000, no, 14,000 in the audience and approximately 8,000 inmates on the phone. It's a historical event in Narcotics Anonymous history. Historical event in Narcotics Anonymous' history. So much so. Now, my part in that... I'm going to try and tone down because, you know, this program is not about ego and it's not about pride and, it's not, and, and being humble. But I want to share this stuff with you because I, I, I got to be in this place because of the stuff I do. I didn't get to go in this place because I'm an asshole or a jerk. Kind of reminds me. At 15 years clean, my children, I asked them what they thought of me. One compared me to Hulk Hogan. Another one called me like Polly on that Chopper show. And the other son said, I'm like the dad in The Sopranos. That's at 15 years clean. So you can imagine what I was like in my early years, right? 
So anyways, uh, at one of our conventions, we had made some relations with California Department of Corrections, and, and I've been involved in those relations with some of the, the, the uh, management of California Department of Corrections and in the communications. And, and we brought up to them how in past years we've had a trouble with this Unity Day call, and we got this commitment from the management that they'll make it happen. So we didn't have high hopes. We were just hoping to have San Quentin, maybe Folsom, call in and get to participate. So we did our best to try and get as many as we could. And, and by game day, seven days before the World Convention, we had seven prisons signed up. That was, that was great, seven prisons. It had never been done before. That Saturday, I got a phone call from the Chief Deputy Director of Department of Corrections, who's now the Undersecretary. She said, Jerome, how many prisons do we have? And I said, we've got seven. She goes, that's not good enough. I want 33. <laughs> she said, I can make it happen. Can you get me another day and a half from World Services? I called World Services. They said, yeah, we can give her another day and a half. I got her back on the said, Terry, it can happen. And, and then I asked her if I could be inappropriate. And she said, yes. And I said, you're fucking awesome. <laughs> At that point, Monday morning, when I went to work, my email was blowing off the hook. Every prison in California had contacted me to sign up for that phone call. Every prison in that day and a half had signed up. I, I'm talking about prisons that told me by phone that they couldn't do that, that they wouldn't do that. So needless to say, when that day came, they were all there. And since that day, I've talked to Avenal or Folsom or different prisons. Avenal spent two days with electricians wiring their gymnasium so those guys could participate. That's unheard of in H&I work for me. I'm used to getting there and being told I can't come in because I'm not cleared. I'm getting told, used to be told that I can't come in because they're on lockdown. And I'm not used to having doors open for us instead of slammed in my face. But when I do H&I work, I don't care if I can get in. It's a good day for H&I. If I can't get in, I can't wait for the next day. Well, it's really unusual for us to have doors open for us, and that's why I wanted to share that for you. At least in the California Department of Corrections right now, there's opportunity for us to improve our services because they're opening the doors, and that doesn't happen very often. So I urge you guys to get involved with Stan or your local H&I because you guys got prisons right here and we got fire camps. I urge you to get involved. The doors are open. I don't care if you've been arrested. I don't care if you got, we got, for fire camps, we have 180 individuals cleared, and over 50% of them have felony records. That's kind of unheard of if you think about it. So anyways, as a result of that call now, the next world convention is in uh, Philadelphia. Philadelphia. I got a call from Connecticut. They want to copy California. How'd you do it? So I've been working with Connecticut to do the same thing. I got a call from Alaska. How'd you guys do that? Can you help us? Alaska's wired in their, their convention there. Now I'm here in Philadelphia is trying to match Connecticut, and the warden who was at the World Convention that I, I met from Texas is now trying to get Texas in the call. So if you don't hear anything else about the World Convention and tell them, pay attention to that Unity Day call, try and call in, because there's going to be states all over these United States calling in with their prisons, and that's just phenomenal. So that's my pitch for H&I. You know, I didn't expect to be there. I didn't expect to be on the end of that phone call. But I was there, and, and, and thank God. So back to re my recovery outside of H&I. I'll talk about this last year. I'll tie back into what I was telling you about that research I did. How am I doing on time? I'm done? Three minutes? I'm done. <laughs> D-O-N-E. Uh, the last, la well, let's go. March 6th. 2011, I held my father's hand as he passed away. Now, I don't know about you guys, but that's a gift of recovery. To be there holding my father's hand, I realized that I want my sons there by my bedside, laughing and joking and giving me crap just like they always do. I want to go that way. So I was blessed to be there holding my father's hand. And I can tell you, if I was getting loaded, I would not have been there holding my father's hand. I would have been as far away from that place as I could have been and loaded out of my mind and missed the event completely. August 6th, my mother had a major stroke, took out 25% of her mind. September 29th, I got laid off from my job. December 6th, I kicked my brother out of my mother's house. In March, I found out my youngest son is suicidal. 
And I don't even know how to deal with that. I don't even know how to deal with that. I know that I used, used in a way that would kill myself, and I can relate that way, but I don't know how to deal with that. I'm trying. July 5th, my mother just died. That's after bringing her back from that stroke, able to drive, doctor saying she's a miracle, just for her to die not too long ago. I share that stuff because it goes back to that research I told you about. You know, what, what am I going to do when those things are happening? What would you do? For me, I go to meetings. I call my sponsor. I continue to do my service. And in between there, sometimes I cry and I don't know why. And other times I laugh and I go on one day at a time. So hopefully you can take that with you that no matter what, as Margie said, no matter what, we don't pick up. Thanks so much.